All right, this week we are going to round out our organ flukes um, and mostly our worms by looking at the nematodes. And I want to start by comparing the groups of worms that we've looked at so far. So we saw the trematodes first, which were the fluke flatworms. We have the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, the segmented flatworms, and then we have now the nematodes. So the common names for these groups, the cestodes are tapeworms. Remember again, they, those are segmented flatworms. The trematodes are flukes. Those are non-segmented flatworms. And now what's new in the nematodes is that they are roundworms. They are not flatworms. If we compare them from a reproductive perspective, the cestodes were all monoecious, right? So hermaphrodites. There were two different groups in the trematodes. You had the monoecious organ-dwelling flatworms, and then we had the dioecious blood flukes, so the schistosomes, if you recall. And in the nematodes, they are all dioecious. There's a couple funky ones, which we'll talk about, but for the most part, you're going to see male and female versions of each worm. As we can see here, they all go through that egg larva adult sort of thing, so there might be multiple forms that you need to recognize. The cestodes or tapeworms were both intestinal and tissue dwelling. The trematodes we saw were intestinal, tissue, and blood dwelling. And then when we look at the nematodes, they are pretty much just intestinal and tissue dwelling. They all, unfortunately, have very complicated life cycles, which is a bummer for you, but what would you expect, right? If we look at some new vocabulary that comes up with the nematodes, oh, let me go back, I'm sorry, jumping ahead. There are many nematodes who will have eggs that actually have to be in the environment and sit there in order to mature. So we have seen a little bit of that when an unembryonated egg is passed and then it embryonates, uh, particularly with the flukes. But this is sort of a new thing where there's really an environmental incubation required for progression through the life cycle. Now let's take a look at the vocabulary. We have two new forms of larvae that are specific for the nematodes, the roundworms. Those are the, the rhabditiform larvae and the filariform larvae. Rhabditiform larvae are like a very actively feeding, moving stage. Filariform larvae are usually the infective stages. It's kind of like tropes and cysts, isn't it? Where you have that actively feeding troph, it's causing damage, it's, you know, wrecking the organs and then you have the cyst which is sort of preparing to leave the body go into the environment and likely be the infective stage later so a little bit of overlap there because the nematodes are roundworms and they have developed some form of digestive system they actually have mouths we did not we did not see mouths in the the cestodes and the the tapeworms because, or the cestodes and the trematodes, excuse me, because they had sucking discs, but the discs were just for attachment, not for eating. You actually have what's called a buccal cavity, which is the mouth of the nematode, and we're going to see that that's going to be important for diagnostic purposes in some species. They have complete digestive and reproductive systems, so they do need to ingest. They have a tube. That tube is going to pass the nutrients that they take in, you know, very similar to ours, obviously much more simplistic. Whereas in our other flatworms, when we looked at the segmented and then the flukes, they didn't have really digestive systems. They just sort of absorbed things through their integument. So this is a like a step up on the evolution. Let's go to our first case study here. We have a huntsman who killed a bear, prepared it for eating and freezing by cutting it into roasts, steaks, and grinding the trimmings. Later that same day, he ate a burger made from the fresh meat and cooked it rare. Two and a half to maybe three weeks later, the hunter experienced fever, diarrhea, muscle pain. Um, he didn't get medical attention for probably another six weeks. He had elevated eosinophilia and several lab tests were ordered. The Division of Parasitic Disease Reference Diagnostic Lab got some of the bear meat to look at. So this is actually a chunk of the meat from the animal that he killed. They did a digestion technique with pepsin, which you know, is a protein digesting enzyme that becomes active when mixed with hydrochloric acid. And they did what's called a muscle squash, which is exactly what you would expect it to be. It's just a piece of muscle squashed between the cover slip and, uh, you know, another slide. So I don't even have the pictures up here because even from this 
this discussion, you should kind of have a clue as to what it might be. And then once I show you the pictures, I think you're really going to have an idea about what it might be. So here are the pictures. You can kind of see here, you can see the striations in the muscles. You can see the encysted larvae here. And then a little bit closer there. And then if we zoom in, I think they're going to zoom in on maybe something like this or... I don't know if it's from this exact thing, but you can see the picture here. Hopefully, you were able to tell that between these three pictures, this was Trichinella spirellus. And that should be really obvious because it is a very spirally shaped thing that gets insisted in muscle tissue. In this case, we're looking at the bear's muscle, but we will also see that it can show up in human muscle tissue as well. What they will do from a specimen of choice perspective is, you know, who wants to do a muscle biopsy? Nobody. They will actually do ELISA testing for anti-trichinella antibodies, and that will give us a clue if you have the disease or not, right? Or the parasite, I should say. Trichinellosis, you might have the disease. This is just that other image of what it looks like. So the larvae are insisted. They insist in the nurse cells in skeletal muscle fibers, and they tend to cause the symptoms that you saw in the case study, which was like pain and fatigue. It's, it's called the great imitator because the, the symptoms that you get when you have trichinella are very flu-like. They're relatively mild. They don't necessarily bring up anything really big. And because these things are insisted in your muscle, it's not a digestive thing. You're not seeing, you know, diarrhea or real obvious signs of infection. You just don't feel good because of the presence. This is an insisted larva um, of trichinella in muscle tissue. You can see it's been sliced and stained with hem hematoxylin eosin. And it's at about 400, 400x. So these are some, some non-sliced and stained, and then this is sliced and stained. So what you're looking for identification-wise is if you see a slide that has muscle in the background, you should immediately think trichinella at this point because... Of the ones we've talked about so far, it's going to be the only one that embeds itself, insists itself in to the muscle like that. And it forms a spiral, hence the last name spiralis. And let's take a quick look at the life cycle. So you can see it's kind of complicated. It doesn't look very cyclical, but in fact it is. What we're seeing over here are the kinds of animals that can kind of harbor this, right? So if a pig were to eat the muscle of another animal, whether it's a rat or another pig or something like that, that had the insisted larva in the striated muscle, it would contract trichinella. If a rat, you can see that they are oftentimes carnivores, were to eat the muscle of another rat that had it, they would contract trichinella. The infective and diagnostic stage of trichinella spiralis is that insisted larva in the striated muscle. Now, if we eat the muscle without it being cooked and pork tends to be a common place where this this is acquired essentially we can contract and come down with trichinella as well so after exposure to gastric acid and pepsin once you eat the meat the larva are released from the cysts and they invade the small bowel mucosa where they develop into adult worms and they're little they're like one to two millimeters in length now when you look at the worms remember there's a male and a female it's almost always that the female is larger than the male and the male is going to be have a curly tail. Now, really, you're not going to see much of these worms in, in the stool. They don't get passed in the stool because they want to live in the muscle. That's where they develop. They don't leave the human body. So to see a male-female adult worm would be kind of unusual unless you went there looking specifically for it. So after about a week, females release larvae that migrate to the striated muscles where they insist. And then it takes four to five weeks for that to happen. Once they do that, they sort of live there and just kind of perpetuate the cycle, right? So ingestion of the insisted larvae perpetuates the cycle. Rats and rodents are primarily responsible for maintaining the endemicity of this infection. And what I'm doing and reading to you is kind of the blurb that the CDC gives that goes along with this picture. Humans are accidentally infected. So we are accidental hosts when we eat improperly processed meat of these carnivorous animals or um, eating the meat you know, of the bear that happened to get it, whatever it might be. We are dead end hosts because in most circumstances, you do not see humans eating other human meat. So you'll essentially have these insisted larvae 
and they're going to cause trouble in the muscle. They're going to cause trouble. Um, <laughs> that's Lewis. He is causing trouble as I make this video. Um, they're going to just kind of cause that nasty feeling for a little while. And then usually it's relatively self-limiting. You know, as long as it's not embedding in an organ that's going to lose function with it there. And as long as you don't have too many, uh, the muscle should be overall okay. So infective stage, diagnostic stage is the insisted larva in the striated muscle. But truly for diagnosis, we would most likely do an ELISA test. One thing that is kind of unusual is that these worms will be laying live larvae, which what we'll see in a lot of the other worms is the they lay eggs, right, which then hatch into larvae, but not here with trichinella. And that adult stage is very short lived. They do not spend a lot of time um, as an adult or that that maturation to an adult is very short lived. And then the whole process repeats. That is trichinella spirillus. Let's look at one more in this video. And I'm going to read you the description here. Oh, I forgot here. We've got some symptoms of infection, muscle tenderness, headache, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea. Again, kind of an imitator because we don't know, you know, these are all very vague symptoms, right? All right, let's take a look at our next case study. Hard to read. I'll read it for you. A 49-year-old man, no known travel history, had a colonoscopy. Physician observed small worms during the procedure that were about three to four millimeters in length. That's visible with the naked eye. They were submitted to the pathology lab for sectioning and staining. So I want you to look at these pictures. This is not something that you would probably see in the lab. This is actually a worm that has been sliced and stained. So you're looking at the inside of the worm. You're actually looking at some of the reproductive structures and essentially the eggs that are inside of the worm. Normally you would get a different stain or a different specimen. And I will talk about what that is once we talk about this nematode. Images were sent to DPDX and they tried to figure out what it was. If you take a look at this, again, this is not something we will have in our, um, our lab, but I want you to look at what the arrows are pointing to. These are eggs. And this is a really good example of the egg that would be kind of diagnostic. So you can maybe pause and see if you can figure out what this is. Or I can just tell you that this is a case of Enterobius vermicularis, which is pinworm. And the diagnostic features um, that we're going to see here will be primarily based on what that egg looks like. But I'm going to show you a better picture of that. And this is going to be something I guarantee you're going to see in your laboratory career. So if we compare the male and the female worms here, the male worm is on the top. These are not a very good, like, to scale situation here. Uh, but the male worm, and as I said before, the male worms are going to have a curvy tail. That's a pretty common thing in the nematodes. So that's how you're going to tell them from the females. Obviously, the pinworm name comes from the female tail, which looks kind of pointy like a pin. And they are larger, 7 to 14 millimeters for female, 2 to 4 for male. Just tends to be kind of how nematodes roll. Now, a couple of diagnostic features to help separate these things from other worms, although I think they're going to be pretty unique and I don't expect you to have much trouble, would be something called the esophageal bulb, which is sort of, you know, up towards the top. It's a structure that's part of the digestive system, as you might assume. And then on the male here, you can see these little wings, basically, that are called ale. And that's kind of unique. It's around, this is the buccal cavity here. And you can sort of see that they are surrounded by these very clear little wings called ale. So male pinworm here with the curvy tail, not pointed. Female pinworm, pointed tail. If we look at the eggs, and again, this is going to be something you're very familiar with. The eggs are oftentimes very numerous in someone who has this. These eggs are actually pretty well embryonated, meaning you can actually see the little developed worm in here, right? Not all of them are like that. This is an example of the worm or the egg that is not fully embryonated. There's a little gap between the embryo and the shell. And you can kind of see there's sort of two layers here in, in the outside and the shell part of the, the egg. And one of the other things that's very diagnostic is that there's always a flat side to the egg. So if you look at the eggs, they are flat on one side. It's not going to be super flat, but it's flat enough, right? The slides we have in lab for these are fully populated with eggs, so you will not have trouble locating these nor identifying them. This should be one of your freebie organisms. 
Now, how do we normally diagnose? Because we normally don't get cross sections of adult worms. That's silly. What we normally do is something called scotch tape prep. So as we will see in the life cycle, excuse me, the female worm will actually lay the eggs at the anal opening. And that will be able to be detected by using a sticky paddle. So this little thing here has like an adhesive on it. You actually just press it up against the anus and the eggs will stick. And sometimes the adult worms, depending on when you do it. And then you'd look at that under the microscope. The other version of that is the scotch tape prep, which you literally use just a piece of cellophane tape that you press against the anus and you'll pick up the eggs in the worm and you look, you, you just stick it onto a slide and then you'll see it. And it's, this is a really, really common nematode. It's little kids get it all the time. The eggs last a long time in the environment, passes around very, very readily, very often. And so it would be surprising if tapeworm, or excuse me, tapeworm, pinworm, as it's affectionately known, hasn't been the experience of somebody uh, that you know or yourself. I can definitely attest to knowing people who have had it. So let's take a look at the, the life cycle. It's very simple. You're going to love this one. We are infected. So the infective stage here is through ingestion of the egg. And when we ingest the egg, the, it will essentially get to our intestines, right? They can even be airborne and inhaled, which is another reason why they're so infectious. They get into the, the gut. The larva will hatch in the small intestine. The adults will establish themselves in the colon. So they live in the large intestine. And it takes, I don't know, about a month from when you're ingested to when the females will undergo oviposition, which is depositing eggs, right? The lifespan of the adults, two months. Uh, and what will happen is, so once you have an adult female who has fertilized eggs, and this is the greatest part, the pregnant females, the gravid females, will migrate at night, nocturnally, outside of the anus, and they oviposit, so they deposit the eggs, while crawling on the skin of the perianal area. And so this causes... Uh, itchiness, essentially. There's a name for it. I'm going to put it up here. Itchy butt. I mean, that's not like the, the greatest name, but it's called pruritus ani, which it literally means itchy butt. So imagine that you have a bunch of little kids whose butthole itches. They're going to scratch it. And then when they scratch it, that's on their dirty hands and they touch everything and then you get pinworm and they continue to infect themselves with pinworm. So once the eggs are deposited on the anal opening, they obviously can pass with the feces. They can be, if there is fecal oral contamination, if there's, um, you know, fecal, you touch with your hands and then touch surfaces, they survive for quite a while. And you can see a couple other things. Sometimes what will happen because it only takes about four to six hours for the larva to fully become infective. They can actually hatch. And when they do that, they can crawl back up the anal opening kind of like the female worms do, and live in the colon. That's retro-infection, like backwards infection. Auto-infection is where you just ingest some of the eggs that you released through the fecal sample. So the infective stage and the diagnostic stage are both the eggs. Usually the diagnostic stage, the egg might not be fully developed, but it just depends. Um, but the infective one has to be a fully developed larvae in there. Pretty exciting, right? Itchy butt. We are, I believe, the only host. If I'm not mistaken, let me just confirm. We are the only host. Um, they lay like 15,000 eggs. Pretty terrible. And obviously some of the other symptoms. Itchy butt. It's irritating. Sometimes people get nauseous or vomiting. They have difficulty sleeping because this all happens at night. Isn't that lovely? All right, we'll end this video here. We'll move on to some more roundworms. I think this is probably one of the more disgusting discussions, so hopefully that keeps you engaged. All right, let's move on to video two.